Hello plant lovers, it is Matthew in Melbourne. Thank you very much for finding me. And if you're new here, I grow cold, cool, intermediate orchids here in Melbourne, Australia without greenhouses or grow lights or humidifiers, just me and them inside or outside or they're out of the pool. So plant lovers, if that sounds like your conditions and your type of orchid, do hit subscribe. I post every Friday and you can follow my continuing amateur adventures as I try to figure out how and what I can grow. But what I do know I can grow are, ta-da, Sarcochylus orchids. Now, this one is called Maria Jam Drop. Hmm. Uh, I've made quite a few videos about Sarcochylus orchids. And for those of you who might not know, they are a native Australian orchid. I'll drop some images in of mine in bloom. And they are native to parts of the country more north than where I am. So they're not native to where I am here in Victoria the state of Victoria, the city of Melbourne. However, they do seem very happy in my environment. So for me, these orchids are grown outdoors all year, under cover, so they're protected from rain, but they get bright light and the cold, bah, well, that's relative, isn't it? Cool, cold winter nighttime minimums. Now, Melbourne's uh, climate is described as either wet Mediterranean or warm temperate depends which way your wind is blowing. So we don't have the same zonal systems as you do in the States. But in a nutshell, our winters are cold and wet, but they don't freeze. So our temperatures in the city center rarely go below five degrees centigrade at night in winter. High 30s, low 40s Fahrenheit. So getting to freezing point, but not quite. And we, not in my experience, have had frosts in the inner city here in Melbourne. Some of them, of course, can be dry and hot, but it can also rain here in Melbourne. So our climate is actually quite conducive to growing lots of things. And obviously Australian orchids kind of love the conditions, strangely enough. But those conditions are actually quite similar to lots of parts of the Mediterranean, obviously, parts of South Africa, uh, New Zealand, and some parts of Western USA particularly have similar climates to this. Anyway, Moral of the story is I grow them outdoors all year, but if you're in a place that is wetter and colder in winter, you'll have to grow them indoors. The secret is to give them plenty of winter light because that stimulates the flowers. But we are not here to talk about care. Oh, no, no. I've got a playlist, which I'll link, which goes through all of my ramblings about care. I have, as is my wont, bought four seedlings. Hmm. In fact, I'm lying to you. One is a seedling and three are divisions. So I'm going to repot them. But firstly, what I thought we might just do is just look at the difference between a seedling, which is this one here, and we'll call this a division. You can see obviously size is one of the factors, but they are different. So we'll have a look at what that means. Okay, plant lovers, exhibit A. This is a sarcochylus called Elegant Heart and I have featured this in other videos of mine. And again, for those of you who might not know, Sarcochylus bloom late winter, early spring, depending on where you are and what your weather conditions are. Now, I bought this plant when it was about that size a couple of years ago. Very, very vigorous growers, as you can see. And I would say, in normal circumstances, that is over-potted. But these quite quickly become specimen plants and I just <laughs> couldn't be bothered with the prospect of endlessly repotting. So it's in a fairly attractive terracotta pot and it will just stay here. And it has bloomed and it has very quickly grown many, many offshoots. So Sarcochylus, although in the wild they are sort of lithophytic, they grow in those nooks of rocks where there's debris that is collected. So their root space is quite constricted. It is one of those native Australian orchids that doesn't seem to mind a bit of a generous pot. It will still flower. Anyway, generally though, I would be potting, always pot them down, smaller, just the size really of pot that the root ball will fit in, nothing any larger. So forgive me for this one. Anyway, that's not what we're talking about. What I wanted to show you is the growth habit. So as you can see, if you were to look at one stem of the plant, it has a growth habit that's very much like a vanda. But what these orchids do very, very quickly is establish multiple growth points, as you can see. And they, and I'll, I'll come in closely and show you, they actually appear at the base of the plant, can you see? 
and can, well, be separated. So it's a little bit like a pup forming on a bromeliad. And these little side plants develop their own root systems. And obviously, the, the, the bigger and more established the plant that is, the more of a root system it's going to have. So if you were in the mood to divide one of these plants, you will find that all of these little plantlets have their own roots and pot up quite easily. So what we have here is just that. These are the offshoots or the side parts or the mini plants of an established plant. So why would you choose that over a seedling? Let me put this rather heavy plant down and I'll tell you. Now, as you probably would know already, Vegetative propagation, i.e. taking a cutting or a part of the plant, means you have a new plant that is sold genetically identical to the parent, which means you are guaranteed to know what the flower, color, form, shape, fragrance might be. So you've basically got an identical plant to the mother plant, a clone, if you will, except it's not been cloned, it's been vegetatively grown. So this is how you can guarantee what you're going to get. Now, Sarcochylus, Oh, in the last 20 years or so, particularly in Australia, have been hybridized a huge amount. So there are many, 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 many hybrids, many of which are unnamed because they are just so common and so prevalent. And when you've made your cross, you can't really be sure what the flower is going to look like. So if you're buying a division of a plant, hopefully the person selling the division will have a photograph of the flower of the parent plant so you know exactly what you're getting. So this one, which is called Maria Jam Drop, we know it's gonna look like Maria Jam Drop. Now, this plant here is a seedling. And as you would know, seedlings, it's the luck of the draw, it's like children. You never know which parent it's gonna take after. And then in a successive generation, you might get a child that looks more like a grandparent or a great-grandparent. That's the wonder of genetics. So this one is a cross between Sarcochylus amber orange and Gabrielle well spotted. Now, somewhat of a misleading photograph here because we actually don't know what this one's going to look like because it's crossed. Who knows what it's going to come out with? So that is one of the things about buying seedling uh, Sarcochylus in Australia is that because it is has become incredibly popular to hybridize and try and create your own fabulous color of and form of sarcochylus there are so many seedlings out there and you really have no idea what the flower is going to be like so this one we know is a cross between um, an orange colored one and a spotted one so you'd imagine it's going to be orange and spotted but we'll have to wait and see good news is seedlings only take a year or two to bloom this which is probably a first year seedling, the end of its first year, could well bloom this winter. We'll have to see. So that's the essential difference between buying a division and a seedling. Division, you know the color you're gonna get. Seedling, a bit of a gamble, but worth it. Now, price-wise, uh, that one doesn't have a price, but the larger divisions were $20, and I seem to think these were about $12. So that's kind of the price comparison we have here. And, the backstory to these is that I belong to a species orchid society here in Victoria and they have a biannual plant sale and this is why you need to join orchid societies near you plant lovers because you get access to growers and they always have plant sales or swaps or auctions and it's the greatest place to find unusual things. Anyway, this particular grower, can I find their card? There we are. It's called Mount Beanock and I will put the link below, although, the sad thing is that they are winding up their business. So in fact, they will not be trading, I think, for that much longer, maybe the end of the year. So I saw that they had a stand at the fair and I thought, you know, I've got a lot of sarcochylus, but now or never. So I kind of went crazy and bought four. And one of the great things is because these are divisions of existing plants, the seller had photographs of each of the mother plants so I could see exactly what the flower was like because one of the issues of having many orchids of the same species is that you can get lots that are quite similar. And I've discovered I have got lots of red sarcochylus. So I was looking for things that were a different color, the yellows and the oranges, and things that had bigger spots. The other thing that hybridizers are trying to do with sarcochylus is develop plants with larger flowers. So we'll have to see what I've got here. But now, plant lovers, what we're going to do is repot them. 
Uh, it is mid-autumn here in Australia. Now, autumn, depending on the type of orchid, is not necessarily a bad time to repot. Spring is usually best after they've bloomed, but this is a plant that doesn't really have a dormancy period, so it's kind of growing all the time. And in Australia, you tend to get more water and rain in winter, so there's not really an issue with Salsicalis in terms of repotting them now because they're not about to go into dormancy. You are still watering them throughout winter. Dialing it down, but you are still watering them. And as you can see, very vigorous root system. Now, they'll be setting their flower spikes mm, in a month or so. So it's kind of the last hurrah for me to be able to repot them if I didn't want to perhaps interrupt that process. So there we go. And because I'm that kind of guy, I'm using terracotta. Now I have, if you've watched some of my older videos, got into the habit of drilling my own pots now. But with Sarcochylus, I, maybe familiarity has bred contempt, I really don't. All the ones I've got are in solid terracotta pots with just a drainage hole. They don't have aeration holes, even though it is a lithophyte epiphyte growing in those little nooks and crannies where material has gathered. So they usually get a lot of air movement and a lot of air around the roots. But anyway, they seem quite happy potted au naturel. So plant lovers, what we are going to do is pot these up and I'm gonna show you that process. Before I do that though, maybe I need to show you the mix. Hmm, this could be contentious plant lovers. Now, this lovely tray of gorgeousness is actually my recycle dish. So what we've got in here is all the medium from things that have failed. So they failed quite early on in the piece. So maybe they were seedlings or they were new plants that just didn't make it very quickly. So the medium hasn't broken down, it's not particularly old, it's just already been mixed. So this is a mix of medium-sized bark, it's a mix of sphagnum, you can see perlite in there. But what I've also just thrown in there is a handful of out-of-the-bag orchid mix, and that is medium-sized bark, a little bit more gritty and soily. So I use that a lot. Well, I use it for all of my native orchids, but I also use that for aroid indoor plants as well. So it's fairly loose, fairly free draining, but not as loose as just the bark would be if you bought bark from an orchid specialist. So this is what I'm using. It's a mix. Recycling potting mix is, you know, not a great thing. It just depends on the age of the mix and what it's like. And just tell by the condition. Does it smell off? Does it feel fresh? Does it look good? That's the rule of thumb. And these orchids are really not fussy. Okay, I'm going to swing the camera around and we're going to have a look at these. Okay, plant lovers, so here's our bag of tricks. Here's our mix. So that's, as you can see, um, my <laughs> recycled mix. And we have got this sort of medium-sized pot. Okay, let's have a look at our first. So this is a division and this was the one that was called Maria Jam Drop. Let's see what the roots are like. You never quite know what you're going to get. Now, the other thing to point out is that this plant would be quite happy in this container for, well, at least another year. But you know my feelings about black plastic. I just like the aesthetics of terracotta. So that is why I am repotting it. So there you go. As you can see, quite thick, chunky root system. And what you can also see, hopefully, is let me take out this little bit of bark now. So in fact, this illustrates this whole point of, of vegetative reproduction. So can you see this little plantlet here? It has its own roots there, and it is sort of not really super connected to the, the stem of the main plant. Now, <laughs> I wouldn't, this would need to be a bit bigger, but when this little plantlet has grown up a little bit more, you would literally just break that off and you'd have a plant like this, which you could then pot individually. So that's how these two other divisions have come about. Okay, so good healthy root system, except that one, which is a bit squishy, and this one, so I'll just trim those off. We're just gonna trim off these rotten roots. There you go. So there we are. We have new roots emerging. We've got a new root emerging there and quite a healthy looking little division. Let's pot it up. Other thing is, as this plant has not been in this medium for very long, I am gonna quite simply add these bark pieces to my <laughs> recycled mix. 
there you go it gives them a bit of a mix in let's get our first pot put a generous handful in now first ingredient a slow release fertilizer i use a six month release fertilizer these pellets are heat activated so they're generally going to be releasing their goodness spring to autumn whenever the, the weather cools but of course if you get a hot spell it will release all of its ingredients at once so you might need to apply this a couple of times a year it depends on the weather anyway I'm going to put a few grains into the mix like that not too much I'm not a feeder and then a few grains of mycorrhizal fungi which is this powder here just a little bit of a splash so these are the spores of the mycorrhizal and it will grow and develop within the soil and mycorrhiza has a symbiotic relationship with all plants with the roots and it enables the plant to extract nutrients and water from the soil and the mycorrhizal fungi get the benefit of the energy that the plant produces through photosynthesis so a symbiotic relationship either way mycorrhizal fungi promotes healthy root growth so it doesn't hurt the plant and can only benefit it so don't be frightened of mycorrhizal now i don't want to get this too deep so i'm just going to hold it up so we get the the medium level basically to where it was which is just below those roots the roots of sarcochylus are a mixture they are terrestrial they can be aerial but because they grow in those nooks and crannies the roots sort of form a mass so some will penetrate the soil and some won't don't worry about that and don't worry if you bury one that wasn't um, under the soil it's not going to rot or damage the root so let's just fill a little around there trying not to bury the plant too much Okay, don't compact it too much. Give it a bit of a tap, let it sort of settle in. And there we are. There is our first division potted up. I won't linger over the others, but we'll just see what the roots are like. This one is Elegance crossed with Bernice Klein. Let's just see what roots we've got. Not bad, there we are. Quite a few rotten ones though, I must say. Let's just trim off those rotten ones. And that little one in there. And that one in there. So on this plant, what you might not be able to see, but here is basically the sort of the rhizoma stem, which is the piece that would have been connected to the, the mother plant, which has been cut off. Um, so not a huge amount of root growth, but we've got plenty of roots emerging here. And this one is still active. So that will be fine. They're very tough plants and they do regenerate quickly. And actually what we can see in here is another little growth point just starting to emerge. Ha ha, okay, let's pop this one. Okay, and the third division, hmm. Well, that's clever, it's got two labels. Very different, Sarcochylus mala, red, white. Peace cracker, bright red and white, hmm. <laughs> well, who knows what this is? Let's see what's going on in the pot. Hmm, great roots. We'll just trim off this little dead one here. And actually, you can see even better on this one, the, the point where it was removed from the mother plant. So can you see that? the stem that was connecting um, this plantlet to the crown of the, the mother plant. And I think, so we can see little root buds in here. And well, that might actually be a little plantlet bud coming up there. Who knows, it doesn't really matter. Anyway, healthy little division. Let's pot it up, great roots. Okay, let's have a look at our seedling. So different kettle of fish in terms of its genetic origin. Let's see what the roots are like. Not bad, so we've got two rotten roots, which we are going to trim off. Plenty of scope there, there's not an issue. Excellent. Now this is 
as I said earlier, slightly, well, quite too large, but they are vigorous growers, so I'm not gonna really worry too much about the size of the pot. It could have stayed in this pot for another year or so, but as I said, not a lover of the little black plastic. So there we are, plant lovers. I hope you're not horrified by my reuse of, of old potting medium. Now, as you can see, there is quite a bit of old sphagnum moss in this. Now, I would not normally use sphagnum moss in sarcochylus because they are fairly drought tolerant. Here in Australia, they are used to the degrees of our rainfall, which can sometimes go weeks without rain. So I wouldn't normally use sphagnum moss, but it's just in that recycled mix, so it won't do them any harm. If you're potting them for indoor culture, though, in, a, in parts of the world where you can't grow them outside, I wouldn't use sphagnum. I would just use any sort of free-draining orchid mix. Out-of-the-bag orchid mix will be fine, but anything that's loose and free-draining because they don't want to stay soggy. As with many orchids, that can cause the roots to rot. And as I've said in probably all of my care videos, you can really allow these to dry out completely between watering. And as I said, uh, they don't really have a rest season because here in Australia, our winters are actually quite wet. So they are used to getting rained upon in winter, probably more so than summer, I would say. But as I also said in care videos, it is the winter light that really stimulates their flowers. So if you've got sarcochylus and you can't get them to bloom, put them somewhere brighter. They can take direct light. The leaves will get burnt and will not look great. It won't kill the plant, but it will probably really stimulate its blooming. So I try to find that happy medium because I don't like sunburn and sunspots on the leaves. But growing in the wild, you'll see them in the most appalling condition because they are eaten by insects and fierce sun and all manner of other things happening to them. So it's up to us in, in potted culture to try and figure out what is the best sort of compromise for that. But as much light as you can give them. There we go. Now we are coming into the cooler periods here in Australia. It's mid-autumn. In winter, the, the flower spikes should start to appear and they will then open and bloom late winter, early spring, depending on the type. My species, Sarcochylus hartmannii, is always the first to bloom late winter and then the hybrids sort of come out after that. If I manage to get any blooms from these four, I'll do a follow-up in spring when they're in bloom. And I also have a Sarcochylus specialist that I'm hoping to be able to go and make a video with when all of his Sarcochylus are out in bloom in spring. So watch this space. If I can manage to tee up with him in time to get that happening, I certainly will. Anyway, plant lovers, for me and my four new Sarcochylus, even though I vowed never to buy any more because I had enough, we are wishing you farewell. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks for finding me. If you want to follow my continuing adventures and become a rambling amateur like me, do hit subscribe. I post every Friday and I look very much forward to seeing you next week with a continuing orchid adventure. Until then, take care.